So this is just a great pleasure for me um, to introduce Dr. Leo Mazo. Um, <clears throat> Leo G. Mazo is an associate professor in the art department at the University of Arkansas, where he teaches courses in American art and cultural history. He received his PhD in art history from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He has published on George Ennis, New York Dada, regionalist painting, and the senses in American art. His book, Thomas Hart Benton and the American Sound, Penn State University 2012, received the Charles C. Eldridge Prize for outstanding scholarship in the field of American art. And I can also add that Leo has recently accepted a new position as the curator, a curator at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, a position he'll be beginning this June. I have known Leo for many years now. Uh, when I was a, a doctoral student at Penn State, he was one of my mentors. I was very fortunate enough to work with him uh, at the Palmer Museum of Art on Penn State campus and to take several of his American art classes and seminars. I um, know him to be a true scholar, and I feel lucky to call him a friend. Uh, when Marion Wardle and I approached Leo about speaking in this symposium, Leo came back with a counterproposal, which was both to speak and to sing, since uh, music of the West can best be appreciated by actually hearing it. And we were delighted by that proposal. So um, this is a wonderful way to kind of conclude our first day of this symposium. Um, <clears throat> Leo will first present his talk entitled Visions of the West, Benton and Hopper, and then he and Brittany Stevenson will perform. After we set up the schedule, we realized we hadn't uh, allowed a time for a Q&A for Leo's talk, but, for, un but fortunately, we do have a bit of a pause after this session concludes, and um, we have dinner at six. So uh, Leo mentioned that after he plays, he's more than willing to informally discuss questions or things with anyone afterwards, but he will present his talk, uh, and then um, we will be pleasured to hear from the coverlets. Uh, so please join with me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Leo Mazo. Wow. Well, thank you so much, J Jana, and thank you, Ma Marion. Uh, it's a pleasure, it's an honor to be here. The exhibition's great. I just got the catalog. It looks fantastic. And I love how BYU Museum of Art organizes exhibitions. And it's not just like the museum gets all these great paintings, you know, this best of BYU, best of the Stark. It's not like they're all dressed up with nowhere to go. They, they make things accessible and, and meaningful. And I'm, and I'm really um, grateful to play a very, very small part in this. So when Mary, and well actually Jana contacted me <coughs> this, this summer and spoke to me about this, I think I said something like, have you ever heard the words American West come out of my mouth? And, um, but then she reminded me that the two artists I've worked on uh, most recently maintained lifelong and complicated relationships with rapidly morphing uh, with the I ideologies of a rapidly morphing American West. The regionalist, Thomas, the regionalist artist Thomas Hart Benton was born in the so-called Old Southwest, and he would refer to this area as the Southwest long after such a frontier mythology had waned, like a sense, over a sense, century later. Uh, and his father served five terms in the U.S., House of Rep Representatives representing Southwest Missouri. The painter's gray knuckle and namesake, Senator Thomas Hart Benton, himself the father-in-law of John F F Fremont, championed Western expansion and manifest destiny as we know. Um, from his early depictions of trailblazers, pioneers, and westbound locomotives to his later recreations of the Missouri River in Montana and events like Custer's Last Stand, the artist embraced the West as both historical fact 
and stereotype-laden mythology. Equally committed to American scene imagery, though a wildly different persona, the artist Edward Hopper and his wife Jo, took, who's an artist as well, Jo Nivison Hopper, took numerous excursions through the Trans-Mississippi West, if we can call it that, beginning in 1925 when they bought their first Bu Buick. Over the course of several summers, they traveled to central Mexico, El Paso, L.A., San Francisco, occasionally uh, uh, lingering in the Rockies, but this provided material for a relatively small number of compositions, La landscapes, views of, as we see on the left, and from uh, ho hotel rooms and motel rooms. Yet Hopper and Benton share a sense of the West in almost self-consciously generic terms as a site through which to move. They join a long list of contemporary cultural commentators in constructing a fictive, loosely defined West, one that at times is not Western at all, and which is always chock full of transportation imagery. And I'd like to take a stab as to uh, why I think that is. Benton explored the West by way of a touring automobile. Beginning in the mid-1920s, he began a long-standing yearly practice of two or three months summer so sojourns in which he would travel by car with friends and students in search of source material. He usually took circuitous routes with long breaks to sketch and interview individuals, often exchanging trading cigarettes and quick portrait drawings for his subjects' oral histories and musical tra transcriptions, but keeping far more sketches than he parted with. His early excursions through the Texas Panhandle in New Mexico yielded drawings with elongated and often high horizon lines, again providing materials for several landscape paintings, passages, and murals over the coming decades. His emphasis on trains and roads contrasts with the sense of containment he also found in the area. Believing that authentic, even primal folkways were eclipsed by dollar-headed modernity, in his 1937 autobiography, Benton commented, quote, the pioneer West has gone beyond recall, as if alert the media, right? The land is largely fenced. As if thinking of Turner's announcement of the closed frontier and getting his dates a little bit wrong, he says, but the West clings to its past. It does not acquiesce with the official ending of the frontier in 1890. It does not readily let go of its first wild days, of the drama of its first wild days. Benton had a hard time letting go of that drama, too. He was conflicted. What might, as we look at a work like what we see on the left, ask yourself, what might it mean to fence a boundless expanse. Perusing his oeuvre in autobiographies, he wrote a lot of them, you get the sense that he's in some sort of rush to bear witness to many sections, even versions of the West. His forward slanted trains and boundless roads remind of the, of, of the artist's necessarily efficient immersion into a gigantic and labor-intensive project of geographical documentation. Oil derricks, cattle, and workers' shacks are among the things punctuating this spare expanse of land where the plains, meets the, the plains meet the West. In his autobiography, Benton registers empathy for the workers in the shadows of those derricks, exploited by a capitalist machine, the fruits of which they will never enjoy. An oil boom in 1926 had made Amarillo the business center for the Texas panhandle, but labor and capital had not peacefully existed since the late teens when about 10,000 Texas and Louisiana oil field workers walked off the job to protest long hours and low pay. Wages were raised, but only after about 25% of all workers had been fired. Benton, as you can see, relied on these earlier drawings for the West Pam for the West panel of his first completed mural series called America T Today, which he produced for the New School for Social Research in New York. And here, we, as you can see, where the derricks provide an axis around which rotate a, wielder, a welder soldering a large pipe, a windmill, more derricks, and at lower right, a fossil fuel burning diesel engine. For all its productivity, 
The modern West is awfully wasteful, Benton seems to say. The enormous tornadic plume of black smoke is the result of burning oil necessary for the production of so-called carbon black, a, a fine uh, carbon powder used especially in car tires in the 20s. The smoke had previously appeared in Benton's 1928 Boomtown, a view of Borger, Texas, as a sign of environmental ru ruin, as he put it in the biography, a great, wasteful, extravagant burning of resources for momentary profit. The ecological sacrifices are also found um, in an adjacent panel from America Today, Coal, a similarly biting political commentary on the black lung ravaged overproductive overproduction plagued coal industry. But at left, as the artist suggested in his title, the West was indeed changing. Several of these changes are represented by forms of and allusions to transportation. Much as the red-shirted red welder replaces the cowboy relegated to the background, so the Model T right here with the gas sta station. Uh, supplant the horse and shepherd with staff at upper right. The three airplanes presumably scout the planes for additional oil fields and the derricks accommodate oil for gasoline and, and myriad other automo automotive and industrial uses. <coughs> He also observed the infrastructure that facilitates the trains, planes, and automobiles he locates in his west. Numerous drawings depict roads, diners, and especially hotels and motels. The emphasis on transportation and communication imagery in Changing West and other pieces locates Benton's regionalist agenda in something more than just some visual litany of landscapes, peoples, and customs that might be attributed to some outlying region. For Benton, this term, re regionalism, meant not just depicting, but reaching, literally, the re regions. In this way, his regionalism parallels a series of articles from 1928 by his good friend Lewis Mumford called The Theory and Practice of Regionalism, in which the critic forecasts a neotechnic age in which roads, airplanes, and electric power plants would decentralize social processes and cultural forms previously limited to urban centers. Benton's transportation full west even more closely matches Charles and William Beard's American Le Leviathan, which posits transportation and communication technology as a quote-unquote web uniting disparate national se sections. Railways, telegraph lines, airplanes, and the radio, wrote the Beards, override historic political boundaries, welding this country into a single economic organization, end quote. In Benton's pictorial universe, transportation would provide the literal key to connecting the various American Wests within a larger national body. But westbound trains were not necessarily metaphors of historical promise. Passenger and freight traffic entered a decade of steady decline, as you might guess, in the late 1920s. In his 1937 autobiography, he noted the truth about a lot of railroad travel. It was more a symbol than an actuality. Of Trinidad, Colorado, for example, he wrote, quote, every freight train that came to town had a big cargo of bums. These bums were not ordinary tramps, but workers of all sorts who had lost their jobs and wandering boys for whom depression time life had become unbearable. And looking at these images, as we can see, Benton recycled so many passages and motifs first captured in the drawings of the 20s and early 30s. <coughs> of particular interest here are those instances in which he repurposed the imagery of one region to another. A 1934 painting depicting the effects of the Dust Bowl on far western ne Nebraska, first exhibited as Nebraska Farm, appears as an homage to the Ozarks when Associated American Artists distributed it as a lithograph not four years later. Benton himself could conflate Wests in the space of a single vin vignette, or different sites on the plains anyway, as he does in his depiction of Jesse James 
in his 1936, A Social History of the State of Missouri. <coughs> he depicts the middle ground melee following a Northfield, Minnesota bank heist, and the foreground rob robbery was on the Chicago and Alton Railroad in the vicinity of Blue Cut, Missouri, not far from St. Louis, in September of 1881. Maybe Richard Slotkin was stating the obvious when he observed that it was not true in local history of Jesse James that made him a modern and American social ba bandit, but the pseudo-history that was fabricated for him in the mythic space of the dime novel in a wild west. This is indeed a mythic space to which Benton consigns his so-called wild west bandits, outlaws who justified their bank and train ro robberies and murders as last-ditch Confederate complaints against bitterly constructed Reconstruction era, bitterly contested Reconstruction era Miz Missouri. Something of the opposite happens in Arts of the West, a panel in Benton's next mural called The Arts of Life in America, and I'm showing you a detail from that mural at, at right. And this was commissioned for the reading room of the Whitney Museum in New York. So on his walking and driving tour of summer 1931, Benton encountered two music-making brothers from Galena, Missouri in Stone County, southwest portion of the state near his own native uh, Neosho, Missouri. By the time Benton met them in 1931, Wilbur and Homer Lev Leverett were already famous for their guitar and fiddle playing, respectively. Benton drew the Leverets on the spot and would use their likenesses for folk authenticity on an as-needed basis, like so many recyclable characters in a reusable past. Formerly closest of all these images, formerly closest to the drawings is the painting Missouri Musicians, which highlights the brother brothers along with an accompanist on accordion. Yet here, Benton's Ozark Missouri musicians are meant to evoke some platonic type of West. <coughs> Arts of the West is a densely packed panel composed of three cells of actions, in each of which Benton takes special measure to ensure that the Western experience is heard as well as seen. Signs and other text in the picture tell us that the action unfolds in Tiff City, a very small town in southwest Missouri on the Oklahoma border near Benton's Neosho. So where exactly is Benton's West, where the so-called arts of the West tra transpire? Again, in keeping with the idea of the old Southwest, it obviously extends to southeastern Oklahoma and southwest Missouri. In fact, through, throughout his oeuvre, his titles and his imagery, and throughout his bio autobiographies from 1937 to 1969, he conflates Great Plain, Plains, Old Southwest, and The West. Yet Arts of the West does have its share of specific sectional imagery and which accords with modern ideas of the West, perhaps a trans-Rocky Mountain West. The vested card player at left, named Slim, is one of two extremely inebriated horsemen Benton met in New Mexico in 1928. An artist in America, Benton recalled that after his dinner, Slim went over to the stream, vomited his meal, sorry, washed his faith, face and drank more. Unlike, Marble, unlike Marsden Hartley and, other, and all the artists visiting Mabel Dodds, Luan, and others in Taos, Benton spent almost no time in Taos or Santa Fe. Slim told Benton that the visiting artists there in New Mexico were all elitist nuts, <laughs> retreating to a nativist, awfully awful, homophobic tone, typical of Benton at the time, he added, it's no great wonder that the ordinary run of New Mexico people lumped the artists altogether as nuts, vain women, priggish aesthetes, minor poets, and fairies. That language, by, by the way, got Benton, his homophobic rants, got him f fired from the Kansas City Art Institute not too long after this. 
It's a sort of pity, he adds, that the people of the most beautiful land on earth should have been inflicted with all the artistic drolleries just when Western America was ready to take some special interest in the social place of the arts. <coughs> Finding some putative, real, some supposedly normative West was part of Benton role-playing in a performative context. Benton spent much of an artist in America fashioning himself as a tobacco-chewing, rough-and-ready type who had no use for modern convenience. Paralleling contemporary, still lingering currents of American exceptionalism and isolationism, his dealer, Associated American Artist, uh, promoted him as the tough hombre from Ms. Missouri. In Benton's pictorial universe, Wy Wyoming figured much more prominently than New Mexico, emerging as a sort of anti-Taos. On his 1930 trek, Benton carefully re recorded his newfound friends there, folks like Will Ream from Tullus, and Tex, the red-shirted card player at Left in Arts of the West. Tex was actually a professional Bronco rider from Fort Worth, but Benton, Benton met him at a rodeo in Saratoga, Wyoming on July 4th, 1930. That rodeo, which he sketches, which you see at left, provided this storehouse of subjects to which Benton would turn in that Arts of the West mural that you saw and so many other projects. After Benton drove several thousand miles with his student, Glenn Rounds, in the summer of 1930, the two men managed to obtain special access to the rodeo grounds, they were for, at first prohibited from there, uh, by telling the organizers they were official artists on assignment for the Denver Post. They weren't. As you can see, the rodeo watercolor, lassoing horses in turn, is the basis for the vin vignette at right in Arts of, of the West. Thank you. The Wyoming rodeo episode is of special interest because the artist recounted its detail and its details and circulated an offset color re reproduction of lassoing horses in conjunction with an NBC art on the radio program with which Benton was very closely involved called Art for Your Sake. The show comprised a series of dramatizations of the lives of famous artists, including Benton in early January 1940. Ben Benton appeared um, on numerous radio and television broadcasts, but he used his art for your sake appearance to underscore the national and cultural importance of regions far outside, far removed from New York City. So how would this work? You would subscribe to the radio for $1 per, per year, and you would receive a handful of reproductions to consult, and that's what this is. This is an offset colored litho of the watercolor, lassoing horses, that was in turn the uh, preparatory in advance of Arts of the West. I know it's several layers removed. And you can see that, you know, it, they would come on the air and they'd say, but meanwhile, those of you who already have this, if you've paid your dollar to subscribe to this, you'll want to place before you the painting, Lassoing Horses. It's a Cines Pound painting, of course. I mean, it's a, it's a uh, offset color litho. But the narrator would tell listeners just when to consult the painting. Radio programs joined his murals, illustrated books, and mass-marketed prints in achieving the dual goals of realism, not only to make art intelligible by way of trademark so-called American subject matter in objective realism, but to do so through the complex channels of communication, sonic and otherwise, that enabled their painted and otherwise limbed message to reach locations well beyond New York City limits and go into the regions. The transportation imagery, roads, trains, cars, of several other works we've seen is here replaced by wireless technology that has a similar agenda of reaching the regions. Throughout the 1930s, Benton envisioned murals as the ideal medium for reaching more people. The mural program of which lassoing horses is part, in turn, cast the radio itself as an agent of, out, of outreach. 
Just right of center in Arts of the City, another panel from the Arts of Life in America, he depicts a so-called plump diva singing on the radio, his words, not mine. Taking credit for bridging the gap between cutting-edge pedagoging and the remotest audiences, Art for Your Sake could scarcely have circulated more appropriate subject matter than Benton's Wyoming. The last state in the union to the last state in the nation to develop an AM radio station, 1922. Wyoming didn't have standard electricity lines until 1940, at which time its roughly 271,000 inhabitants comprised less than 2% of the nation's population. Further suggesting the state's relative isolation and uh, modern conveniences long enjoyed in other locales were dubbed only recent advances in the 1941 American Guidebook for Wyoming, writing, quote, the recent development of rural electrification sent the smelly kerosene lamps into the dump heap and has replaced the washboard and the talking mach machine with the electric washer and the ra radio. This is 1941. In keeping with regionalism's dual mission, Images and commentary about Wyoming life and culture reached that state, although not through a Wyoming radio station. You would hear it from a station in Boise or KOA in Denver. In keeping with uh, lassoing horses, arts of the city and arts of the West, all of these support radio's role in bringing the city to the West, and you might say the West to the city. And then there's Edward Hopper. Lovely Edward Hopper. He had a very different relationship with the regions, never mind the West. Like Benton, however, for all of his pedestrians, automobiles, trains, and marine craft, we find at least as much attention to streets, diners, lighthouses, gas stations, and other structures that facilitate these conventional modes of communication and transportation. Figuring prominently among these service institutions are hotels and motels. Early in his career, Benton produced over 30 covers for two leading hospitality services trade magazines, Tavern Topics and Hotel Management. And these provide a storehouse of motifs and themes that he would enlist in several of his best known paintings and watercolors. Joining these sources, surely, were memories of the artist's own visits to hotels, motels, and tourist homes. Before and during his marriage to artist Joe Nevison Hopper, he spent a lot of time in these lodgings, and it's tempting to think that, to some extent, they helped shape his worldview. As you can see, he stayed in the Wiesman Motor Court in El Paso. I think he stayed there several times, actually. In fact... Much of what we know about the artist, not just his travels, but the larger biography, comes from correspondence written on hotel and motel letterhead, providing an expressive outlet for an otherwise, how to say this, taciturn, slow to open up artist. But before we say that Hopper was liberated by the open road in the vast spaces of the American West, we have to remember that he just, he just wanted to be left alone, and traveling due west from New York achieved this. On their 1941 road trip to Los Angeles by way of stops in St. Louis, the Garden of the Gods in Yosemite, and other points, Joe could write that Bryce Canyon was simply incredible, but Edward did not want to stay long enough to paint. He kind of liked the California missions. He thought they were the real thing, certainly more real than hectic Los Angeles and San Francisco. The Hoppers were also pretty cheap. Joe wrote, that fellow, Joe wrote to fellow artist Kep Peggy Bacon that they preferred simple lodgings. The tourist camps are a joy. A little house, plenty of plumbing, a kitchenette, your own garage, $2 a day if you don't pick the most flashy. By this point, they had driven 5,300 miles crisscross style across the nation. Gail Levin, Hopper's principal biographer, reports that on this trip in 1941, the two waited in Great Salt Lake. According to Le Levin, Joe wrote in her unpublished diary that Hopper got more than a little upset when she insisted on taking a tour of the Mormon temple. He would just as soon have spent his time down south at Zion or Bryce. Sorry. On an earlier trip, to, I got per permission to say that. On an earlier trip to Santa Fe, 
the first, actually the first road trip he and Joe took together, Hopper had refused to paint, like refused, said no, to paint the super popular motif of the Palace of the Governors, although he did find his way to paint at least three additional watercolors, two of which we see here. A lifelong de devotee of vernacular architecture, he may well have marveled at the merging of Hispanic and Pueblo styles, if that's what we really see, in the ranch house at left. In the larger watercolor at right, he captured the eclectic architecture of St. Michael's College as well, but he refused to send this to his dealer. Joe recalled that at a, that a gunshot-laden corn dance and other native ceremonies left Hopper just cold, and there is indeed no small distance between subject and beholder in these works from Hopper's first Western road trip. The art historian Nicholas Robbins has shown that, like Stuart Davis and other artists, Hopper used his automobile as a studio on wheels, frequently, as Davis does at left, literally employing the window as the frame to the composition, and we can discern these in, no, in, in more than a few paintings. So the distance between the artist's vantage point and the house at right is not unlike what we might see from a car passing by. This watercolor called interior is in fact the only interior Hopper produced from the 1925 trip to Santa Fe. Flanked by a suitcase at left and a trunk at right, Hopper suggests that his model, Joe, has arrived at or is soon to depart from their rented room. Although Hopper apparently, Hopper was apparently the one anxious to drive through the West to be able to say he did it and to depart for home. But I want to return quickly to the 1940s jaunts to California for a few more minutes. It's well known that Hopper visited Yellowstone, not just Yellowstone and Bryce, but also the Grand Canyon, Yosemite, several missions, the Oregon coast, Yellowstone, and so on. For all the time he spent in the West in the 40s, summer after summer, he appears to have made very few works there. A watercolor of the Oregon coast survives, as does Joe in Wyoming. Our historian Vivian Freed is probably right when she suggests that the car for Edward and Joe was a portable studio. But it also provided a glass and steel barrier, I think, for an artist who was most comfortable with the vantage point of the, win of the windshield, of the carscape. So they had something art-wise to show for their protract protracted travels. Joe had to beg him to make a few quick watercolors, one of which he produced in San Mateo, California, and the other at the base of the Holy City Rock Formations at the Shoshone National Forest in Wy Wyoming. Now, clad in blue jeans, eager to take in scenery and local history, fantasizing over frontier ideologies, escaping to the West, Benton may have been what historian Michael Johnson might call a New Wester, not so Hopper. In the West, as in New England, for the Hoppers, it was less about where they were going than what they were getting away from and how they would get themselves there and back. This may help explain the recurring automotive imagery. Produced in 1957, Western Motel is one of the few oil paintings by Hopper depicting Western imagery. He painted the work in January or February of that year while in Pacific Palisades, California on a fellowship from the Huntington Hartford Foundation. Almost all of Hopper's oil paintings are imaginings and rough composites. Um, and Western Motel seems to combine elements of motels he's known to have visited, as well as materials from the hotel trade magazines he illustrated much, much earlier. A preliminary drawing shows that the artist originally envisioned the space not as a private room, but as a lobby with three seated figures, a, se a sign in the parking lot visible through the large window, and a bell on the front door, among other passages he would alter in the painting. One of the more telling changes concerns the parked automobile just outside, parked on the diagonal in the study, but more or less parallel to the window in the painting. Positioned this way, the automobile's horizontal lines repeat those of the bed frame, the background mesas, and of course the road itself. As was so often the case with the artist, the figure here, it's Joe, his wife Joe is the female model in all of his paintings, seems ready to go to the next spot Joe seems ready to go to the next spot on an itinerary, 
her bags packed, and her blue sweater on the chair at right. Or maybe she just got there. Either way, the subject here is not some Western Mesa, but rather quick and ready mobility. Other than the imminently departing woman, perhaps most prominent is the large plate glass window, the trapezoid shape of which exaggerates the painting's perspective plan, suggesting the potential energy of the green Buick parked outside. Obviously, this was not the first or last instance of the artist using a foreshortened pane of glass to evoke sensibilities of simultaneous flux and stasis. The transportation imagery also evokes more popular and commercial in, in imagery. Up until the 1980s, signs for Howard Johnson's Holiday Inn and lesser-known motels enlisted trapezoid and rhomboid shapes to suggest something like a road marker taking your vehicle to the site. When he positioned the green Buick in such close proximity to the motel room, Hopper may or may not have been aware that the automobile and residential construction industries were in the mid-1950s competing for resources with which to fabricate, fabricate plate glass. The adjacency of car and motel continues the work of the picture window in bridging the gap and suggesting a, a sort of continuity between inside and outside. This dynamic points to the physical closeness of technologies of rest and motion and ultimately potential and kinetic energies in which we see in Benton's work as well. Comprising ever larger elongated glass sheets and minimal embellishment, the plate glass window was a part of mid-century modernism. But that slickness, that transparency, that joining of inside and outside was bogus. It was a facade, according to social commentator John Keats, that's really his name, whose mucking, whose muckraking satire, the crack in the picture win, win, window, found the large window an allegory of post-war ease and happiness that seems at hand, but which is fleeting. What interests me most about this is not only the pivoting seated model, but many of the props that recur in his hotel scenes. The bed on the di diagonal, the collapsible leather suitcase, for example. So I'm working on a book on Hopper, and ultimately I've, I'm asking, what are these places? Hopper said they were just composites of many places and nowhere in particular. Is it just the mesas and the title that make the work at left a Western mode motel, some generic West? Benton spoke quite similarly about his painted regions, finding a generic identity, a type of the West more than a specific locales, in his rodeos, derricks, and locomotives. He claimed that the real subject of the arts of life in America is a generic one, as he wrote, in the end, merely a conglomerate of things experienced in America. When he was asked about the horses at Wright in a later interview, he commented that, quote, this radio thing can be seen any day. The picture's technical processes may one day be outmoded, he granted, but, quote, as long as you'll have a rodeo, you'll see something like that horse picture. So I'm afraid that what the two artists have most in common in their versions of the West are a slipperiness of specific place and a use of transportation imagery to suggest a way to, through, and ultimately out of the place. Thank you. Now, this, this morning we heard a wonderful presentation by Dr. De Deloria about branding the West, but he also spoke to us about Westing the brand. He talked about the reciprocal natures of how affect, the outward project, projecting or perhaps refracting a feeling might work. Now, obviously we're going to provide some musical entertainment now, but it dawned on me that some of the songs that that we find, Brittany, who's, we formed this band called the Coverlets in Northwest Arkansas, that some of the songs that we play can be such as Jesse James and a song by the Decemberists called Rocks in the Box, which is about mining and a flood and a mine shaft. Those are examples of branding the West. By the way, I do know Hot Rise. I haven't heard them, but I know who they are. Hotel California, talk about a hopper-ready uh, 
Im image. And Rocky Raccoon, we think, on the other hand, are westing the brand. So we'd like to play you a few music, a few musics, a few songs. I'm real good with the book learning. Um, and, um, and play for you a couple of musical versions of the West from long ago and from the last few years. So please join me in welcoming my bandmate, Brittany Stevenson. <laughs> 